Good morning. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, thanks for braving the elements and joining us today. Uh, we have still our shoe boxes to be um, passed on to, to the coordinators and all the rest of it, but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Notices are on the back of the order of service for your information. We do have uh, Remembrance Sunday two weeks' time. Not two, yeah, two weeks' time. So that will be starting slightly earlier to be in place for quarter two so that, no, starting slightly later so that we're in place for 11 o'clock across the, you know, you know what I mean. You've done this more than I have here. I'm just catching up, so anyway, that, we'll keep you up to date with that as we go. I'm not aware of any additional notices. Okay. Oh, there's one at the back. <laughs> it's just a quick one, just to say thank you to those who turned up yesterday morning for the leaf clearing party. It was brilliant. There were, we were few in number, but we had a great time. And also, thank you for those who couldn't make it, but were behind us in prayer, because the weather was wonderful. Thank you. So returning to our boxes, as we know, these are going all over the place to support people who are very little. And it might be nice and a, a generous act if we pray a blessing on what is given, on who is given, on who will receive, just as we release them to God's purpose. So let's pray together. Father God, we give you thanks for all who out the generosity of their hearts have been able and, and willing to make a box or elements that have gone into a box going from here to places in need. So we pray your blessing on them for giving. We pray your blessing on those who are doing all the labor of moving stuff around and filling containers and all that work. We pray your blessing on them. We pray your blessing on those who will receive what we have given, that it will truly meet their need and bring a comfort and an ease in the difficulties of their lives. So for all that we have given, Lord, we seek your blessing in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'll take that up here. We're singing our first hymn. Save me the trouble. We have done this one before. Okay, there's one new one in the list. But we have done this one before, but only twice. So I'm not expecting you to get it perfectly. But repetition inculcates the tune, gets us familiar, and makes us confident. So if you don't get it all, that's fine. There are verses, there are two refrains that sung after the second verse and fourth verse. If you don't get it, don't worry. Learn the verses. And we'll add the refrain and we'll, we'll belt it out as, <laughs> as best we can. Oh my soul, arise and bless your maker. Oh uh -huh. 
Well done. Well remembered. Let's pray. Father God, we bring our praise. Some that's new and we're still getting to grips with. Some that's so familiar that it echoes in our minds every day. Some praise that is of events that are blessing our lives today. And some that is the burden of things we carry and we praise you in spite of them. So all of our praise, all of our worship, the service of our lives, the fruit of our lives, we give to your glory, seeking your blessing upon all that we give, whether great or small, knowing there is a place and a purpose and a value in your work here and in the world. And so we give it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have our reading for today, and Brenda's kindly agreed to share that with us from the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you. Well, the readings from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. And the first part is headlined, Treasures in Heaven. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the next part is headlined, Do Not Worry. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen. Thank you. This is again one we've done just a couple of times. So again, it's reinforcing. It'll all come back to you. Three verses, very easy melody. The only clue we need to give them, Helen, is the focus. It's a da-da and in. The rest of it's kind of three, four, nice and gentle, but the start of the line's always da-da. You'll pick it up. Focus my eyes on you.
see I've, I've effectively managed to edit, delete out a word, so I apologize for that. Much celebration in the house last night, Nick, was there? Yes, a bit of cheering going on. <laughs> Just a little bit, yes. Well, congratulations to your team. I was rooting for the other guys, mind you, but there we go. <laughs> what is family? Seems a very obvious question. But what is family? Ours just seems to be getting bigger and extending everywhere. And other people's families very small and compact and some folk are scattered across the globe and others, you can't get rid of them. They're always in your house. But it's, it's family. It's, it's, well, it's what? I'm sure there are probably people you are closer to and have a deeper connection with that are not your family than some of your family. There are some of my family I would pass in the street not recognizing them because I haven't seen them for 40 odd years. And yet friends instantly come to mind. Family isn't always bloodlines or it's not only bloodlines. It's the other people who are important to you that you're connected to that you're rooted in, that love you and you love them, who have walked with you through hard times and happy times, through all the ups and downs. They're family, aren't they? We've all got, or a, we had, I have to say, aunts and uncles in our family who aren't aunts and uncles. We just called them auntie or uncle or whatever because they were part of the waft and weave of our home and our lives. And they're good things to have. So family isn't always blood. So when we bring this forward into the concept of what's God's family about, it gets even more complicated. Blood isn't there, or at least not ours. That's another part. We'll come to that later. But we are connected through our faith, through God's work in us. So, the people around you are part of your family. Isn't that frightening? Eh? Because we'll look around, and maybe here's not so bad, but I've been to churches where there are people sitting on one side of the building who have never spoken to people sitting at the other side of the building, and yet they've both gone to the same church for 40 years or more. They don't know their names. I don't know all of your names, because I've got a terrible memory for names, but I'm gradually accumulating them over time. Do you know everybody's name? I'm just giving you pause to think there. If you need to have a look around, feel free to have a look around. Get my view and say, do I actually know everybody that's in here? Do I know them by name? More or less. <laughs> it's the less that I'm worried about. It's not the more. People can slip into a church, sit quietly, and slip out. And we'll never know their name. We wouldn't do that with family. We wouldn't do that with friends. We shouldn't do it here in church. And I know some people are quite private and want to keep us ragtag bunch at an arm's length. I get that. But we need to get to know each other, at least by name, if not by reputation. Because <laughs> we're all adoptees. Each and every one of us is an adopted child. And I'm not talking about your biological adoption, your, your sort of physical being. I'm talking about your spiritual adoption. Every one of us has come from the same place to be in God's family. At one point we were not, 
And through our adoption, we are. Every single one of us. We have that in common. We have that to share with one another. So there is no difference between me or anybody else here or anybody else here and me. The root to being part of God's family is that we have been adopted by God. And that's something worth celebrating, something worth remembering, worth giving thanks for. The hard bit, though, is see all the people around you that you don't get on with. Now, they've been adopted too, so they're part of your family, and you just have to put up with it. And we need to learn to live as one. We need to learn to love as one. And I always think that rubbing alongside one another smooths off our imperfections as much as anybody else's. And we are the better for it. We are polished by one another. But each and every one of us is a hugely important, valued, and valuable member of God's family. And it's up to us to remind each other of that fact. Too often, too much is done by too few. And others just slip in and say, oh, it's not up to me. Oh, I couldn't possibly. I'm not. There. Blah. There's a myriad of excuses. But each one of us has a vital and valued role to play, even if it's making the tea or welcoming folk at the door, or saying a word of encouragement to each other, to offering a hand at home, whatever. You are precious. You're a precious adopted child of God, and that is worth spending time thinking about a little deeper. And that's our theme for our new mini-series it's like TV, mini-series and everything. We're going to sing again. Safe in the shadow of the Lord, beneath his hand and power.
So we've got this little series on unpacking, unpicking, exploring, whatever way you want to describe it, what it means to be an adopted child of God. <clears throat> we often use family language when we talk about our faith, when we talk about being part of the church. But what does it mean? What is the process? How can we be sure that we are, are all God's adopted children? The adoption of us is a critical doctrine of the Reformed Church. That's the boring bit, okay? So what we're doing is, is doctrinal analysis for those who want to look at it that way. But I hope it's something just much more encouraging and enriching. We're going to do this for a few weeks, though we are interrupted on the next couple, as a run-in to Advent. Today we consider the idea of adoption. We rightly think, most of the time, about young children taken into a couple's home, not necessarily related to them by blood, and thereafter legally adopted, and as such to all intents and purposes being regarded as their natural children. They can use the family name, they can inherit, they have all the benefits of being a natural child to this couple. Within my own family, I have got cousins who are adopted and have been since they were knee high to a grasshopper, and they are fully part of our messy, dysfunctional family. And we recognize that. That's a pattern of adoption that we understand. But going back to the times when the Bible texts were written, far more nuanced, far more complex. If we hold that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, as the psalmist proclaims, then every person is a child of God, even if they don't know it yet. And as such, are subject to God, even if they don't know that yet either. In the ancient world, the head of the household was ruler, absolute of the whole household, wives, plural, Children, servants, workers, all were subject to the head's authority, including the children. And if Christ is the head of the church, we are subject to him. What Scripture says is that when we in faith recognize God's sovereignty, his rule, his headship of our lives, our need of him and we turn to him in faith and receive grace and forgiveness and acceptance through Jesus Christ, we are adopted. Our status changes in that instant. We are no longer just someone who has said sorry to God for something we might have done. We become a son or a daughter. We become a child of God with all the rights and all the privileges and all the responsibilities that go along with it. Think of the prodigal son returning home, greeted, welcomed with great celebration. The one that is lost is now found. The one that is dead is now alive. We are reborn. In faith, we are adopted by God, and new life flows from that. There are examples of this right through the Old Testament. Moses was adopted by Pharaoh. Remember, basket, you know the story. Abraham proposed to adopt Eliezer as his heir, when Sarah was discovered to be barren. So he needed someone to pass it on to, and it was going to be this guy. Then changed his mind. It was then going to be Ishmael. And then he changed his mind again. Anyway, Jacob 
adopted two of Joseph's sons. The legal process of adoption, as we have said, regarded that person as being transformed in status, even transformed in their genetics somehow to become a natural heir. So what does God's adoption bring to us? The spirit of adoption changes us. Who we are before God is completely transformed. But I wonder if we really allow that change in our status with God to affect how we see ourselves. So repicture the scene of the prodigal son as he returns home, greeted with a kiss. And the father tries to put the new robe on his back, to put that ring of prestige and family on his finger. Instead, the son, receiving, pushes them away. No, not for me. He chooses to stick with the rags, sitting in the mud, rather than at the table set for him, for the feast. Now we know when we read that account that he resisted the embrace of his father because he didn't feel worthy of it. But he yielded to it. It was that, no, no, oh well, all right then, moment. I'm not worthy, but okay. He allowed his father to put his cloak around him. He didn't drop it on the ground. He allowed him to put the finger, the finger on his ring. You know what I mean, the ring on his finger. Even though he said he wasn't worthy. He did eventually accept it. If he'd thrown them all on the ground and said, no, 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 we would question his sanity. We would say, get up. These are yours by right. This is your birthright. You have a place at your father's table. You're not left sitting out in the barn with the animals. The spirit of adoption imparted to us at the moment we believe, seeks to transform us from the inside out, to take on the family likeness of Christ. And with that comes the authority of the family name to minister the word of the Father to each and every one of his children. But it comes with responsibilities too. We need to remember those whose we are, who we represent. Are we still God's adopted child at home with our wider family, in our workplace, in our rest spaces, in our groups and activities? Would people know whose you are and who you stand for? Or do we slip that ring off and take off that cloak and hide them away, keep them for Sunday, keep them good? The challenge of being adopted is to pick up the ring and the robe, accept them as our own and live it, even if we don't feel worthy of it. Live the difference that being a child of God means to us. Perhaps if the whole church globally started to really live like sons and daughters of God, we would sit up and the world would take notice and things would be different. I did say this was a bit of doctrinal thinking we're doing. So we turn to the Westminster Confession of Faith I should have quizzed you on this, but that would be another man. Which says on adoption, that adoption is an act of God's free grace, whereby we are received into the number of the elect and have a right 
to all the privileges of the sons of God. Right, so what are the privileges of being a child of God? And even if we do a very quick list, they are extensive. We become citizens of heaven. We are transferred from our earthly limitations, our earthly boundaries. We get a new passport, if you like, from God and says, you are now one of my people. Whatever you are on earth, whether you have allegiances to any nationality or whatever, you become part of this one great big kingdom. You are one of my citizens. And with that, we can know deliverance from fear. Because I think that's the greatest tool that the enemy of our souls uses against the church. He makes us fear. Fear to try. Fear to stand up. Fear to speak out. We put on fear like a suit and we wear it. That's not as God's purpose. He wants to deliver us from fear. With that, we have heirship in relationship with God. Right, this gets a wee bit complicated. We are co-heirs with Christ. We see God, Father, Son, Spirit, and we're kind of down here somewhere. And we'll have all sorts of mental hierarchy in there too. He says, no, we are now all lifted up into that connection. We are co-heirs with Christ in God. We share the same benefits as he does because he is not only our Lord and Savior, he is our brother. And we can be freed from care. Do not worry about what you wear or what you'll eat. Worries for tomorrow are going to be enough. Just today's just concern yourself with what's happening around you. We become inheritors of a future glory, which is just as well. Because I look in a mirror and think, what a state. But I know that my transformed being in Christ is glorious and eternal, even if this shell is getting saggy and creaky and gray and not working as well. This is nothing. This is transient to what I will receive as my future being in God. And with all of that, we become an enigma to the world. The world doesn't get it. They don't understand it. They will ridicule it. They will put us down until it catches them. I would have done that. I did that. I used to ridicule Christians at school. It was an easy, soft target. Turn the other cheek, eh? Smack. You're going to turn it now, big man. I did that. And then God confronted me. He said, you're now mine. You're part of that family. And see those ones you've been picking on. They're your brothers and sisters. So go and apologize. Hmm. An early lesson in humility. Because we are connected to each other. We have an affinity and a unity with every other believer. It doesn't say we'll always agree with them, but we are connected to them. And we have more resources at our beck and call. We are led by the Spirit of God. We don't have to fathom our way through the world on our own. We have God's Spirit to lead us and guide us, but most importantly, we are gifted the spirit of adoption. And as Jesus taught us to say, our prayer is our Father. That becomes our heart's cry, that God is our Father. 
And if he's our father, we are his children. I know I'm laboring this, but I want to drill this home really profoundly. Because if this really catches your thinking, it transforms your understanding of who you are in God's eyes. And that list could easily be doubled. We could go through each one of these in huge detail and do whole sermons on the whole bit. But I'm not, you'll be relieved to know, I'm not going to do that, right? This is more just a, a summary, a prese of the, the doctrine. But the one thing I want us to get hold of is all this comes together for a purpose. To allow us to become fearless disciples. Fearless disciples. Romans. For those who live according to their sinful nature have their mindset on what their nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit desires. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons, daughters of God. For you did not receive a Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received a Spirit of adoption or sonship. And by him we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Wow. Wow, even me. I can say that. I am a child of God. You can say that too. You put your trust in him and you can say that for yourself. And no one can take it away from you. One thing that should hit us like a sledgehammer from the list and from that statement is how much affirmation and confirmation is directed to you from God himself. All that resourcing that God wants you to know is there for you, his children. It's not just a case of saying, okay, now you're mine. Go and earn it. Go and prove yourself in the world. Go and show everybody by your own powers that you are mine. Uh -uh. Here is the spirit of adoption. Here is my spirit to lead you. Here's everything that you need to guide you and direct you and fulfill you and equip you and resource you. Here's all this box, ton of equipment dumped on top of you. Now just go and be. We are not sent naked into the world. We are sent with the full armor of God. What a privilege. We need to hear in these scriptures the deepest desire of a father who wants to see his children thrive and flourish. We know what it's like when the kids start to learn to walk, yes? Those of you children, you'll remember it. Mm -hmm, come on, come on, take your first step, come on. And you're encouraging, you're on your knees with them, you're teasing them by holding your hands out and as they reach you, move away so that they take the step. Oh, we, they stumble and you catch them and you lift them up. Oh, that's what God wants us to do, to walk with him, but not on our own. He wants to catch us and hold us and carry us and teach us to walk his way. Or the times when they start making all these weird gurgling sounds. That with a bit of encouragement. And we repeat silly noises in their faces until they copy them. Like da da, mama, mama. We spend months teaching them to talk and years telling them to shut up. <laughs> but we do it. God wants to encourage you to talk for him as well. But he won't then tell you to shut up. He will encourage you to go on and on and on. And with every accomplishment in our faith and in our growing, the first cheer, the first applause of us 
is from our Heavenly Father. And the heavenlies join in. You are celebrated in glory. You are celebrated in glory because you're a child of God. And even when we fail, he catches us and curls us and lets us try again. But all of that encouragement, all of that nurturing that, that parents do with children is only effective when the child responds to the parent. In the same way, our faith is only effective when we respond to God, our Father. If we just try and encourage and cajole our kids to do nothing, and as soon as they see us, they go, no, nah. we learn nothing. We do nothing. We achieve nothing. But when we respond, when we connect, when we grow, we flourish. As I said earlier, I think one of the greatest limitations of the church and of individual Christians is the issue of fear. We can think that it all rests on our shoulders. It's all about us, what we do, what we say, how we behave. And so we get frightened to try in case we get it wrong, in case we fail. If that were the case, the church would never have got beyond the walls of Jerusalem. We can fear what others think about us, but it's not about us. It's about God. If our faith is mocked, it is not us that's being mocked. It is God that is being mocked. And that's one thing that I had to learn when I picked on a Christian and belittled them for their faith. Who I was belittling was not them, but the God who said, hear you, I want a word in your shell like. And I had to uh, repent of that. The kids chorus, be bold, be strong, for the Lord our God is with you. We want the kids to learn that. We encourage them to sing it, to go and be bold and be strong. And then we get to the door and we go, okay, I'm just going to hide in the world and sneak away. And God said, no, be bold, be strong, because I am with you. Don't worry about the 99 things that didn't work or that you couldn't do. Rejoice in the one thing. It did work. Rejoice in it. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So why are we fearfully reluctant? Don't we believe it? We should be fearlessly following. Do we th don't we think that God will not come through for us? If we know God, really know God, we know that such things are just not possible. It's contrary to his nature. So where does that fear come from? From ourselves? Our limited vision of who we are in God? The best cure for that? Fearless discipleship. At its heart, discipleship is just that getting to know God more, getting to know him better, following him each day. We just like fancy labels in the church. Those that follow Jesus got to know him and through him got to know God. At the same God that encouraged all of us to call him Abba, Daddy. So do we follow their example today? Three simple little things. I've preached on this so many times. And I will continue so to do until we all learn it, including me, including me, to read his word more, to pray a bit more, and to do. Reading his word gets us to know him. Even if we just stick with the New Testament to get you started, stick with something. 
pray just to speak with him and listen in our praying too. Let his word fill us, let his prayers fill us, let his spirit fill us till we overflow with him. And in that, go and do whatever he asks us to do. Whether it's a shoebox, whether it's starting a project, a program, whether it's transforming the world, it doesn't matter. If he calls you to do it, you will succeed because he's called you to do it. Simple. There are few organisms that flourish without food or water. Too many Christians try and live without the daily bread of their word and the drink of prayer and they wonder why they don't hear God or don't feel fulfilled or feel weak. Eat and drink, be filled, be full and go. Adoption by God is not a theoretical doctrine. It is not a philosophical idea. It is grounded in action and activity in the very being of the God who we call Father. It's lived out in our faith to prove to the world that our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hand. You are already children of God. You are already so valued, so loved. Please, let it fill you. And that's my initial thoughts on this. We shall unpack some of this again later. But for now, that will do. I can see you feel you get uncomfortable. Another good reason to get rid of pews. Chairs are far more comfortable for long sermons. So think of your derriers. We'll change the pews out. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we can call you Father. And that it means we are your children, your sons and your daughters. Oh, but teach us what that really means for us. For today and for every day that comes. For every moment and every day, fill us so that our joy is full and that fear flies in the face of your love for us, now and always. Amen. This is a new one to you. I know this is a new hymn to you. It's very simple melody to pick up. Um, there is a modulation change at the end. The last verse goes up a wee tone. So if you want to stand, fine. If you want to sit, fine. We're going to learn together. Jesus, what a beautiful name.
you all have spotted the deliberate error on the order of service. Carl did prayers last week. So actually Agnes is going to lead us in prayers today. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll finish with the Lord's Prayer, which will be on the screen, but feel free to use whatever version you're comfortable with. Okay, let us pray. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. We have no one but you, O Lord. We want no one but you. There is none as strong as you, as able as you, you who brought the whole universe into being. You set the boundaries of each star and planet. And in the midst of it all, you set us, men and women, as the pinnacle of your creation. Us, in our weakness and sin. Us, who have messed up almost everything you gave us. And yet you love us. You gave us Jesus and the promise that all who call upon that precious, life-giving name of Jesus will be saved. To Jesus we pray this morning. Firstly, for those known to us, our families, friends, colleagues, neighbours, asking for healing for those in sick in body, or mind, or spirit, for community for the lonely, rejected and unloved, for sustenance and dignity for those who are struggling financially, for comfort and hope for the bereaved. In a few moments of silence, let us name them all before our loving merciful God, he who is able to forgive all our sins and heal all our diseases, who can redeem our life from the pit and crown us with love and compassion. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will rejoice over you with singing. We pray for our world, particularly for Israel and Gaza this morning. We ask for the safe release of every person held hostage. We ask for an exit route for every foreign national caught up in this conflict and for all Palestinian families of peace who wish to leave. We ask that all aid agencies are given unhindered access to deliver food, water, fuel, shelter and medical supplies. We ask for your supernatural protection to surround those men and women of peace who have stayed behind in the north of Gaza. Particularly let your angels surround and protect your church there. We ask that this war would end quickly so that needless suffering would cease. Hasten the day, Lord, when swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, when nation will not lift up sword against nation and will learn war no more. Hear our prayers, Lord. Let us close together with the Lord's Prayer, 
saying, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Shall emerge once more from behind the shoeboxes. We sing our last hymn. It's one that we don't get often the opportunity to sing because it feels odd singing the day you've given us has ended at something like a little... 11, half 11 on a Sunday but I know it's a favourite, it's one of my favourites so it's in anyway to close our worship the day you gave us Lord has ended <laughs> So we go from this place confirmed and knowing that we are God's most beloved children, his sons and daughters. So we go without fear, go with joy, go with hope and rejoicing and bless the world in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit who will be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you.